everyone and <clears throat> we are live with hillary how are you hillary hi sunny i'm great how are you doing excellent excellent thanks for you know sparing this time to be with me i really appreciate it it's nice to reconnect as usual absolutely sunny for you anything we go way back <laughs> we go way back you know in fact that is kind of where i start which is where did we first meet i'm thinking some event in Toronto back in the day, right? Which, do, yep. you, know, do you remember which For one? Sure. I think uh, unless you were at the Bitcoin training conference in 2016 in Toronto, which was held at Mars, it's a two day conference. Were Michael, you there? Michael Brooklyn? No. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think, yeah, well, I was there. Yes, for sure. Okay, <clears throat> so we were there, but I don't remember being introduced to you in the building. What, when I remember meeting you for the first time is that you held the door open as my husband and I were entering the meetup, which took took place like three or four days after um, the, the training conference. So it was around June the 27th, 2016. You held the door. It was taking place at, um, um, on Adelaide Street. Uh, Bit, was it Bit Pay? Now Pay. What was the name of that place on Adelaide Street in Toronto where you held early? Um, um, sorry. Blockchain uh, meetup. ATM. Yes, Paytm at Paytm Labs, and you yeah. held the door and you welcomed us and said, "It's great to see you. I'm Sunny Ray." Yeah, and, and um, that was that, that. That was one of the first big events. That was probably the maybe one of the first big events we did in in Toronto. It, it was started getting with, bigger. There was still pizza in those days. Oh man, I miss that pizza. The pizza. I think we even had. Oh, the one you're talking about. I think Paytm was so cool. We even had like beers and and. Uh, yeah, their, their space was super, it had like a nice vibe to it. And yeah. it was fun. And, and they were so kind to let us use that space back in the day. Yeah, for sure. And then the, it was amazing how quickly <clears throat> the interest escalated because at that time there might have been a hundred of us at um, Paytm Labs. And then the next meetup a couple months later, there were more than 400 people. We had to move it to Mars. And that's when I spoke about diversity in the space right 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 hey by the way you know the um you know what ptm is right obviously because or do no, you i i know and i would never oh. say no what it, something is if i don't so well, okay well well interesting that's why i brought it up because a lot of people don't but ptm is actually an indian company and they are ginormous ginormous they are I don't know how many hundreds of millions of people, like well, for example, when I use an Uber in India, I use Paytm. Wow. Um, but Paytm isn't just like a, like a PayPal. It's, it's like a PayPal, but it's also like, um, it's kind of like a marketplace where you can like buy things and stuff like that. So it's like, it's, it's, they're, they're a really, really big company and a very relevant company. And so uh, that office, PTM, was actually being run by one of their former CEOs, uh, a guy who used to be the CEO of PTM in India, started PTM Labs, which a lot of people don't know is in Toronto, wow. right? And they do a lot of great work. And anyway, they, whatever, I, I digress. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was, that's right. Uh, you did, uh, you spoke, you spoke in one of my events. I remember in, uh, at Mars when things were getting pretty crazy, right? Like, things do you remember those to days? Crazy. I do. I remember those days incredibly. And then it was like the attendance was going up exponentially because mm. by the time another meetup happened like i don't know three or four meetups later the room was getting to be <clears throat> like 1200 people capacity <laughs> everyone was just i mean there Sorry. were yeah it was standing room only people were crowded outside of the room it was crazy we i mean i don't know if people know this but we literally got you know we got the boot from mars because we we were breaking fire codes and yeah. It, yeah it was pretty irresponsible and eventually got out of hand and that's why that's why eventually we moved over to the sheraton right exactly exactly yeah so I, yeah i uh, wasn't able to attend that one but yeah it's been good to know you all these years sunny actually you you didn't you didn't attend the one that don spoke at I did not. No. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I think so you, missed, you, missed some, you missed some good food. You missed some good food, but Indeed. it's all good. Uh, okay, so like Hillary, I was telling you earlier, is is that uh, part of what I'm trying to do is just kind of like capture people's 
Bitcoin stories, if you will, kind of what, you know, how they learned about, well, before that, even like kind of what their stories were and then um, how they learned about Bitcoin and how Bitcoin kind of impacted, you know, the, the trajectory of their, their worldview, maybe their career, whatever it might be. And, and I know, you know, you're someone who's been in the space for some time and um, working with some of the biggest companies in the world <clears throat> and working alongside someone that, that I, obviously I have a lot of respect for and, and uh, you know, I've been reading Don's uh, books for, for a long time, well before I think Bitcoin was even a thing. Uh, and so, yeah, so just curious to know kind of what your story is. Well, thanks, Sunny. It's, uh, you know, I find myself in um, a place that um, is just never where I would have anticipated uh, as a non-technologist um, to be working at the front lines of um, telling the, the story of blockchain transformation and cryptocurrencies is really nowhere I ever expected to be. But I feel very privileged to be here. Um, so today, I am managing director of the Blockchain Research Institute, and we are um, the largest private think tank. And we have uh, probably the, the greatest collection of insights and thought leadership on blockchain transformations, which includes uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but also supply chain applications, everything under the sun. We explore how blockchain is impacting traditional industries. And um, how I got here is can be nothing to short of, uh, um, it's, it's like an odyssey. Um, because, I mean, I was a political studies major at Queen's University. Um, I got my Canadian securities course so that I could work uh, trading uh, stocks and bonds, uh, which I did for a major Canadian bank out of university. And I spent the better part of 10 years in banking. I worked at uh, RBC Dominion Securities. I worked for a major mutual funds company um, called Franklin Templeton. And it was then called Templeton Investments, and they managed the world's largest mutual fund, which was uh, the Templeton Growth Fund, which had been around for decades. And um, uh, UBS Bank, which was the which is a Swiss global um, powerhouse. And um, it was really at my time at UBS that I was exposed to um, fiat currencies um, as as a you know th that that were part of our investment portfolio, like we were dealing every day in Swiss francs and Japanese yen and euros and pounds sterling. Whereas when I was working just in Canada, we were only trading in US and Canadian dollars. So my mm. time at UBS really opened me up to the idea of different global currencies and the friction points in currency exchange and the logistical headaches of, okay, you've got an investor, their they're funds are denominated in pounds sterling, but they wanna buy a Swiss franc denominated mutual fund. Like it just, made the work very interesting, but also much more complex. And um, I ended up having a career change when I had my family, <laughs> which was great. And uh, I gave up um, the demanding job at EBS to spend some more time at home with my kids and raise them. And it was while I was at home, I was very fortunate because um, I was a mom in the age of the internet. And I had the opportunity to stay plugged into the markets, to continue to manage family money, um, to watch, you know, um, different events unfold because of internet connectivity. And while I was um, on maternity leave, I met a woman who changed the trajectory of my career and she was a freelance editor. So I was open and flexible and open to explore um, new opportunities and let my curiosity take me to, you know, uh, down a new path. And in my work with her, we were writing for um, print magazines, we we're writing for traditional newspapers, like printed articles. So this is going back to 2003. And the internet was just emerging as a big deal. Um, websites were becoming um, a, an integral part of businesses and discovery on search was was becoming increasingly important. I mean, at the time, there was still no Facebook, there was no Twitter. So it was all about the web. And um, I remember Don Tapscott, um, who's co-founder of the Blockchain Research Institute, had written a book in 1994 called The Digital Economy. And 
in that book, he described um, the impact of this amazing new technology called the internet and how it would transform business, how it would transform government and how it would transform society. And what he said uh, in the book, you know, 20 years later, it all came to pass. Um, if you think of how we're now watching Netflix, our ability to stream content was unimaginable back in 1994. People were just trying to figure out email and whether it would be a useful tool or not. But Don's vision of um, the power of this technology and its applications to business and society was really quite profound and very, very well received. And that became his, um, I think the first big bestseller uh, he had and put him um, known internationally in circles as the leading thinker at the intersection of technology um, and business. And uh, Don continued to write a couple more books, Wikonomics and Macroeconomics, about mass collaboration through digital channels. And I found all of this very interesting. So at this point in my career, while I am freelance writing, I'm doing research online, thank goodness for the internet. I'm writing on a freelance basis about cities I've never been to because mm. of the information that I was able to access from my little desk in the kitchen while I'm watching my kids. Mm. And that connectivity, that digital opportunity that the internet created for me was really huge. So I could stay plugged in. I could continue to learn about new industries. I, could, um, I developed a new skill in writing and um, editorial contributions, um, research. And then I started to pitch my own articles to um, publishing companies, both Rogers Media and the Globe and Mail. And I did a lot of other freelance work for um, people who were developing online brands of their own, professional online branding. And they wanted to be discovered on the internet. So they needed lots of content and they needed to have a big website with weekly blogs or monthly blogs. And they typically outsourced that to companies who could create these professional profiles. And um, all the while, these new emerging companies that were developing websites were finding it was very difficult to be found on Google search. And the necessary investments in, in Google AdWords, um, the, the, the fact that they were at the mercy of Google algorithm changes really illustrated the power of centralized um, systems and the power that Google had over an individual's online business, really quite um, illuminating for me. And at the same time, I watched this shift um, that was taking place for my clients in the print and publishing industry. I watched how the internet was wiping out newspapers. The size of the print was shrinking. Um, periodicals were going out of business. They couldn't compete with this new business model of free information online. So the being at the front lines of digital transformation brought on by the internet to the print and publishing industry made me think differently about technology and the need to keep up to speed in technology. So in that, um, I became very interested when social media networks were emerging, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And I was watching how some of my former colleagues in traditional industries like financial services were not leveraging digital tools um, to their full potential because of regulatory restrictions or what have you, some of my former colleagues were just, they were not present on LinkedIn. They were not creating authoritative online brands. They were not engaging with prospective clients. They were not building trust online. Mm. And so they were really missing out on opportunity brought about by social media channels. And one of the thinkers I continued to reference as I was trying to compel a certain demographic, um, my age and older, that they really needed to get up to speed in digital tools quickly. Mm. Um, the person I referenced to help change their thinking was Don Tapscott. And when the 20th anniversary of digital economy came out, um, everything he said came to pass. The book held up and he would advocate very strongly for um, interconnectivity and um, uh, collaboration across digital channels. And what's interesting is that when Bitcoin emerged, it was a, a, a fantastic example of mass collaboration by parties who were decentralized mm. in coding up this new transformational software. Mm. And John Tapscott was the first person um, 
in my circles to tweet about Bitcoin and to tweet about decentralization. And when someone of a, you know, quite authoritative, very reputable, um, you know, accomplished, well-known was really starting to take this technology seriously. That's when I thought, ah, I should start to take a look. And when he and Alex published Blockchain Revolution, they described the blockchain and the technology underpinning cryptocurrencies as being equivalent to the second generation of the internet. So being someone whose career was transformed, certainly the publishing side of my career, transformed by the first generation of the internet, watching that disruption hit print and publishing, I quickly realized that blockchain would disrupt the first chapter of my career, which was financial services. And in my early, early days as a banker, I used to process, you know, payment reversals and interest charges and reverse interest charges or, you know, send international wire transfers using SWIFT. And mm. I did a lot of payment processing and I sat back and I thought, would that job, will those jobs still exist? for my kids when they um, seek out professional opportunities. And the best thing you can do as a parent uh, to mm. prepare your kids for the future is to prepare yourself for the future. So I wanted to get up to speed very, very quickly on all of this blockchain stuff, learn about Bitcoin, get myself you know, certified and credentialed and dig in because there wouldn't be a second opportunity to um, get a head start on this. And I wanted to lead. I felt like I was behind on the internet um, mm. and I didn't want to be behind on um, blockchain technology. Interesting. And what year was this? Like when did, I'm trying to remember when blockchain revolution came out, what year was that? So blockchain revolution was published. Um, it launched on May the 5th, 2016, but Don was tweeting about it the year prior as he was researching um, Bitcoin and mm. blockchain. He leveraged Twitter as a means to connect with audiences who mm. might be interviewed or who you know, could collaborate. And that's what was so exciting that somebody as senior and as accomplished as Don was using a digital tool like Twitter mm. um, to collaborate on a project. And to me, that was something that was really leading edge and, and unique um, because business leaders were not using these tools in the same capacity. It was very, very rare in 2013 even to see a senior person a CEO from a bank used Twitter. It was mm. exceptional. And the opportunities, like it, it was courageous to do that. And I was saying at the time, look, this is a big deal. This is a very powerful communications platform. Um, you know, President Obama was sort of getting started and, and uh, um, realizing the power of social media for his 2012 campaign. Mm. Um, but business leaders were very late to the game uh, was just one or two exceptions. So I thought it was unique. Um, I believe that there was an opportunity to, to bring digital transformation about for senior people to become more authoritative and, and to build trust on digital channels. So when in 2015, Don started to tweet about Bitcoin, that was that for me. And I reached out to him and I asked for a copy of his manuscript because I wanted to write about it in the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper. Um, and so we started our very first collaboration, which was me writing an article about why blockchain technology was the second generation of the internet and how it would create very interesting opportunities, specifically for women in leadership. Um, and so it's kind of funny that I have this leadership position at a blockchain organization um, almost four years in uh, and five years after we connected about uh, collaborating on the article. Cool. That's nice. <laughs> it is nice. It is hi, good. So how did you guys, how did you eventually connect, I guess, with Don? Um, yeah. So seriously, how he, did he followed, find about you? followed me back on Twitter <laughs> <laughs> or his social media person. Followed me back on Twitter. We connected on LinkedIn hmm. and he was true to his word. He was true to his word about collaborating across digital channels. And you simply had to send him a direct message and say, 
I'd like to write an article about you or I'd like to interview you or what mm. have you. And he's like, let's do it. He was mm. very open and willing collaborator and um, he walked the walk for sure. And so through digital, I found my next, you know, sort of uh, gig. And then my life changed when after blockchain revolution came out, um, the article was well received. So, do you remember what you spoke about at the event that I that I hosted? Because uh, you were not with blockchain revolution at the time, right? No, because the institute hadn't been founded. Yeah. At that and so point. what were you doing at the time? So at the time, I was doing some pro bono work in the industry, as you have to do to get mm. a foot in the door. Mm -hmm. I was working with um, uh, Kyle Kemper, helping him on some social media stuff specific to um, the social wallet, which he was, you know, working to launch back then and um, working with Alan Wuncha at uh, Token Funder in the early, early days on, mm -hmm. on digital and comms and that. Cool. Uh, um, but at the time, I was speaking about the very touchy subject of gender diversity in the blockchain ecosystem. Mm, and right, I remember. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, you know, those first meetups were underpopulated by um, or underpopulated with women. The meetup that I spoke at at Mars, where there were more than 400 people in the audience, there were fewer than 10% of female attendees. Mm. So it was still very much um, a male dominated area of interest. And I was making the case that through greater diversity, our projects and our innovations have a higher uh, likelihood of success. Because when you have inclusive teams, you build products um, for a diverse group of, of users. Mm. And um, movements, and I likened um, the Budan movement in India about land transfer to the poor, that movement was successful because the campaigns included women. Because without having women, they weren't able to access certain parts of the village. Mm. And while men might have been a de the decision maker, the woman who whispers in his ear and says, you need to do this, is a power player, not to be ignored. Mm. And so through the recruitment of women, um, the Budon movement was able to get its message to, to villages in a way that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. They were able to convince a lot of women that land transfer was a very good thing. Um, mm. So men, men alone wouldn't have been able to access uh, these communities. And I also use the example of Martin Luther King in the March on Washington for Rights and Freedom. Mm. That um, Mahalia Jackson, the gospel singer, um, gave Martin Luther King the nudge to give his I have a dream speech. He had not intended to do that. He had a canned speech, which she had heard in re rehearsal. And she just shook her head saying, that's not going to do it. That is not going to do it, Martin. You need to tell them about the dream. And, and he says, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do the dream speech um, at the March on Washington. And he began his speech in a normal fashion. And if you hear, listen carefully to the recording before he begins, Mahalia Jackson called out, um, she had sung a gospel song um, on the day. She called out to him and she said, tell them about the dream, Martin. At which point he changes his, he drops his speech and he launches, I have a dream. And it was that little nudge, that, that bit of emotional encouragement and that validation from her and that reinforcement to say, no, you need to do this. I'm reading the room right now and you got to do this speech. Um, that was influential. And, um, you know, there are contributions um, that women make to teams that are hard to, um, hard to identify, but uh, that are valuable nonetheless. And those two examples were what I used um, to help encourage blockchain innovators to bring some women on board um, and see what they have to say about what it is that, that they're building. Uh, I uh, just, yeah, today, was it today? No, yesterday night I tweeted, most underrated role in the Bitcoin space are supportive spouses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going to focus, <laughs> but yeah. Anyways, so yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm no, I agree with lucky. you. I'm very lucky. 
Mm -hmm. And and you right. probably know the in those events of four hundred people, if ten percent were four, that's like forty. No, what is that? No, yeah, it's like forty people. I don't even oh, think there were forty women. I think I, I, yeah, I was gonna say I doubt that. There's probably like twenty of which, like three or four of them, was like like my wife and my daughters and them. And so, there's probably I can like, I remember the women who were like there. A handful of people. <laughs> you Anna can name Todd, them right now. <laughs> Emma Todd, Anna, Emma Todd. Anna Badur, um, uh, Caro, your wife, um, Jenna Pilgrim, Daria Pelsanova. There you go. Uh, like there were maybe ten. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it was quite, quite, uh, it, it, remind, it reminded me of engineering university too. Like that, that was kind of like this odd, weird thing. Like you go from like high school to university and it's like, all your classes are just like dudes. It's like, okay, that's, that's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, what you say is very valid about having a supportive spouse. I am incredibly lucky mm. that my husband joined me on this journey. Um, when I had told him that I wanted to do the training course, mm. I said, like, I want to register for this. And we paid, we paid some big money. Like we did not go in for free. We paid our like top tuition, got, you know, a $200 discount. Thanks to a code that Andreas Antonopoulos tw tweeted out. But to have him with me from the get go and mm. get certified and be able to have these conversations as a family and together teach our kids about crypto assets. Um, it's really been awesome. Uh, and you and Carol would probably share this experience that a supportive partner um, can make all the difference in the world. And I see, I see innovators who are very frustrated because this industry has ebbed and flowed and there have been tough times. It's not an easy sandbox to play in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. So um, I was going to also say that, yeah, Dawn, I mean, I think a lot of people don't know what, what, what are like, I mean, I'm not an author, so I don't really know, but what are like the, what were the accolades or whatever behind Wic Wikonomics and some of his books? Like, were they, uh, what do people talk about New York um, Times bestseller or anything? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I just remember Wikonomics was like, it was like a, like a, I don't know, um, it was an important book, you know, an important book. I, I think about it a lot. And, and a lot of people kind of say, oh, well, some of it was obvious, but it's like, well, think about when he wrote it and you know what I mean? And, uh, and yeah. And, and so, yeah, so I, I always had a lot of, I mean, I, I, and, and quite frankly, I don't think, you know, I can say this about Ron Paul, I, but I, I'd also say this about Don in the sense that it was his book for me, at least, right. That I can comment on was a mind opening kind of experience that prepared me for Bitcoin. Right. And, and back in 2011, you know, before maybe even Don and, and Ron Paul and these guys got into it, but like it was because of their work that they put out their work. Um, were guys like me being able to like connect the dots be like oh internet oh you know liberty freedom all these things matter and okay whoa this bitcoin thing could actually you know it has legs so yeah it's so a lot of respect so how do i guess how, what, what happens next for you then in that uh so you you speak at our event and then was it soon after that you started with dawn or when was it yeah so the institute so let me go back to your point about dawn's books and their mm, yeah please significance. like i think the digital economy was hugely significant because it argued that this technology layer was foundational and transformational in so many ways about the internet of information and how information would be transmitted and, and uh, exchanged ubiquitously, um, instantly, and very powerfully. And we've seen the tools that have been built on the internet, uh, the, the um, web applications, digital giants, they rule the world today. Amazon, Google, Apple, Facebook, um, and now there's a threat to dismantle those uh, centralized giants, but they are a manifestation of Don's thesis in 1994 of how powerful the digital economy would become. Mm. And because I recognized that the world was going digital and I needed to go digital too, mm having a grasp of the power of the foundational layer of the internet um, then made me really understand the impact of a, a you know companion layer and that being the internet of value blockchain technology the this incredible innovation <clears throat> that would allow for 
value transfer across digital channels without going through intermediaries for the very first time. And so Don's work on digital and digital economy and economics and macroeconomics, and even his work paradigm shift. I mean, he's the guy who coined that term. He coined these terms about really powerful shifts. And so I, I think you and I know that we're at the dawn of one of these incredible shifts right now in terms of value transfer and the democratization of financial services and uh, the decentralization of the web and this movement being very important and empowering. So I've taken a lot of inspiration from his early works and seeing it being foundational, blockchains being um, the layer on top of that internet stack uh, for value transfer. Um, and so the, the, as after, so the book launched in May of 2016, mm -hmm. and there was a tour that lasted about nine months where they went all around the world. Um, the book had been translated into 18 different languages. Mm. Definitely a global bestseller. Um, and there was incredible interest to, to understand more by the community at large, by the business community and governments in particular, because the book came out at a very early time, you know, uh, considering where the industry is today and where it was in May of 2016, you know, this was before the Dow, this was before the Ethereum hard fork, this was before um, ICOs were even a term. In the book, Don and Alex talk about uh, in, uh, blockchain based IPOs, because we didn't have the taxonomy for initial coin offering. So the Institute was created to take the ideas in the book and do further investigative work that answers some really fundamental questions. Who is using this technology? Which organizations, which publicly traded companies, which governments, or which um, peer to peer innovators? What are they building? What problems are they solving? What are the implementation challenges? What are the obstacles? And what opportunities are, are they creating? What is the value that they're creating? using blockchain technology. And almost four years on, we have 100 different research projects that tell the story of not just cryptocurrencies and crypto assets and non-fungible tokens, um, but you know, individual use cases about um, you know, ride-sharing programs, the EVA Cooperative in Montreal. It's just, a, it's just an incredible example of the use of blockchain um, payment mechanisms, uh, uh, at Overstock and uh, and Newegg, for example, taking cryptocurrencies to, to buy goods uh, online. Um, we have really told the story of uh, blockchain's emergence and significance uh, to business, government, and society. Hillary, I want to ask you something. Uh, I'm kind of di diving a little deep into the, the woods here, but I, I want to ask you something. So one of the things that you know and by the way that you you know about the court case right in india the, the recent one right so one of the things that came out of that for me at least was this um uh there there seems to be a, a deep misunderstanding that or at least in my view that that somehow blockchains are independent of bitcoin or cryptocurrencies or maybe they are i don't know but like what's kind of what's your what's the organization's kind of belief on on that um like are there i guess blockchains that also ha don't have kind of a an open asset that's tradable or uh, you know no maybe, native token <laughs> yeah no native token is that kind of like still a blockchain in your guys's eyes and and you know is, is i guess the government because i mean one of the criticisms from the community has been that that you can't have, like the fact that they want to do, let's say a rupee on the blockchain, if it's in some closed database in the back, it kind of defeats the purpose of like, at least the larger purpose or that a lot of people see in, in this open network. So really curious to kind of know, I don't know what, at least your thoughts are on, on some of that. So I heard it articulated very well by um, uh, John Whalen at uh, Banco Santander, who said, um, all blockchains are distributed ledgers, but not all distributed ledgers are blockchains. Mm. In that the blockchain, the architecture of Bitcoin as, a, as an open public blockchain is um, also a ledger. It serves 
mm -hmm. multiple purposes, um, mm -hmm. ledger being transparency and record keeping. Um, but distributed ledgers, DLT and, mm -hmm. and private blockchains are, mm -hmm. um, uh, they're, they're not blockchains in the truest sense. They don't have a native token. They're in many cases non-extractive and that there, there is uh, only an operational cost by the stakeholders to use the network um, as opposed to uh, platforms being extractive in the form of either mining fees or gas or what have you. Mm. Um, and so it depends whose perspective um, you're, you're seeking. If you're seeking the perspective of the individual that all blockchains must be open and accessible, then, you know, Bitcoin's your chain. But if you're looking at private enterprises who are, who are finding that there's too much transparency in Bitcoin and Ethereum for their comfort level, then they need a different kind of solution. And so we've seen the evolution of the space keep some of the most desirable features um, that made Bitcoin very powerful, modifying and modified them to suit um, a different purpose, a different need. Um, and that need is was very often for closed audiences. And I have a question. So, 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 so is it still, I mean, and maybe I'm like totally butchering it right here. So I apologize in advance, but my understanding was is that in terms of the the organization, there was always more of a, I guess you could say, um, lean towards the blockchain narrative as opposed to, let's say, Bitcoin. Because I know I've been in rooms where you with other bankers or whatever, and Don and all of us, and I'm always kind of like, Bitcoin, guys, Bitcoin is it. Bitcoin's the future. Right. But I always felt uncomfortable. Um, but I'm wondering if that's starting to change a bit because you look at PayPal, you look at MicroStrategy, how Bitcoin not being used for some dark web, I mean, it probably is, but not just for that, but as an engineered synthetic treasury asset mm -hmm. that could not just be 1% of the 1%, as Michael Saylor has been saying, but maybe 50% of everything. So just curious, like, is, is there, is yeah. there a lean more toward, and, but sorry if I'm kind of calling out pink elephants and jumping into the weeds, but oh, they're I, awesome you know, questions. might as well and make it interesting. For sure. I would say at the outset, there was a delineation between, you know, Bitcoin bad, blockchain good, and enterprises were terrified of Bitcoin because of the baggage associated with it. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. you think of Jamie Dimon's narrative. Um, uh, oh my goodness, um, Warren Buffett. You know, these were not great ads for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was, there's just, and there's still baggage that needs to be dealt with. Mm. for people to equate Bitcoin with um, positive, powerful um, transformational associations. Mm. So w we have work to do. We have our work cut out for us and it doesn't help. You know, the, the industry is suffering some hits um, through um, poor practices and lack of leadership. And so it is what it is. And we're still not over that yet. Mm. But what I do think enterprises are starting to recognize is that Bitcoin is a unique asset and it serves a very powerful purpose for enterprises in that uh, store of value being cheap among them. Mm. And where you see um, financial institutions creating opportunities for individuals to invest in Bitcoin um, now through, through, uh, exchanges like Toronto Stock Exchange and 3IQ's Bitcoin Fund and soon to be 3IQ's Ether Fund. Mm. And when we see developments by Wealth Simple, um, allowing a closed loop access to uh, Bitcoin and Ether. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, like PayPal as well, right? It's closed loop. Yeah, and Master, uh, um, MasterCard and uh, other organizations. Mm. We're starting to see that enterprises are getting more comfortable um, offering uh, cryptocurrencies as uh, a solution to capture value and uh, hold on to a customer base. Interesting. Very interesting. And, and by the way, it should be noted too that, and I'm sorry, I didn't get to go to the site and get like the recent list, but can you list off just, I guess, some of the massive like organizations that you guys are working with? I think in my last conversation with you, you mentioned like like data and reliance in India, I think you, I think, yeah. What are some of the other, yeah, yeah. kind of big companies that are working with, uh, yeah, with you guys? Blockchain Research Institute has been very fortunate to have some very um, uh, large and uh, um, 
notable founding members, which include Tata uh, Consulting Services, mm. TCS, and Reliance Industries in India, uh -huh. um, Tencent in China, mm -hmm. uh, Coca-Cola and PepsiCo, um, the largest bank in Africa, Standard Bank, um, uh, CIBC here in Canada, hmm. um, ICICI and Indian Bank, um, FedEx, Microsoft. Uh, it's a big group, IBM, um, Fujitsu. It's been, it really is a global syndicate of um, large organizations who, who each have a different uh, approach and objective. Um, it's in the majority of cases, their interest um, is in supply chain uh, applications mm. um, <clears throat> because a lot of these companies are shipping things and it is in the reduction of, of uh, those pain points in shipping mm. that blockchain is really incredibly powerful. Like I do think um, it's a, a killer app uh, in terms of shipping pharmaceuticals, shipping vaccines, shipping food and being able to have greater certainty and trust over the goods that are that are being shipped and where they're coming from. So are, are there some products or providers or companies that are kind of servicing that need uh, that you're seeing? Yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, there are, there are pharmaceutical companies uh, who form consortia around uh, blockchain applications specific to their industry, one of which is PharmaLedger. <laughs> Um, and they're collaborating on standards that they can all use to have greater certainty um, about the authenticity of the drugs that are shipped and the condition in which those drugs are being shipped. I mean, if you look at the need to control temperature for the COVID vaccine, um, there can be no uh, variance in that temperature. If there is, the whole shipment is wasted. And by having greater certainty about uh, data, um, blockchain is actually able to, to uh, extend the value and actually provide a return on the investment in the technology. I'll give you one of my favorite examples. It's like Golden State Foods. And they use DLT uh, through uh, IBM Hyperledger Fabric. And they're on the IBM Food Trust Consortium. And through IoT technology and blockchain, they're able to have greater certainty that their fresh beef products are completely stable and through having access to transparent and trusted data, they can extend the shelf life of their product. Previously, and it's shocking that in a digital economy, we don't have um, data transparency, certainly in shipping, um, we just do not. It, it's really difficult to solve problems in supply chain quickly. But so you're seeing application, I mean, I've been hearing about blockchain and like supply, uh, and shipping and all that. Um, but I, ha I hadn't ever like heard of any companies, you know, or seen any of that, that were doing it at scale, but you're saying uh, IBM, I guess. So, I mean, they're a pretty big company. It's a DLT. So just curious, what, how is it different than like IBM just having a bunch of servers in the back and doing it? So they have, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you in the, in the Walmart case, they have a, a private, um, chain. They have a, a only approved participants can append data to the Walmart chain. So let's take lettuce, for example. Every participant on the chain um, is an approved participant. It's, a, it's append only, uh, so they can't change information. And they have a fixed number of validators that are pre-established trusted validators who would approve those transactions on a micro scale compared to the way that Bitcoin transactions are being validated by a node network in the tens, in, in the thousands. I so see. So a, well, why can't they just whip that up on a SQL server or whatever, as people always say? Like, I mean, why can't they just whip up that logic in a SQL server? I know you like, think oh, it if, would be. Like if, if Hillary is allowed, you know what I mean? Like just write up some code to do that. Like, how is that? Why do they need a blockchain for it? I mean, I mean, I just don't know enough about it, but you know? Well, the interesting thing is in, in the world of shipping, there's a rule that says data mm. is only needed um, in a one up, one down context. So if I process um, tuna fish, if I have a plant, I only need to know where the tuna was the step before it came to me, which is most probably um, a distributor. 
I don't know where it was before the distributor. I don't know which place it, it came to. And having a blockchain network as opposed to a Google Drive or a Google Sheet mm. allows for extra security. Um, we have heightened security through decentralization. Bitcoin has proven that model. And so if you are to have a centralized server or a centralized database and you need greater security, um, a data breach is much more difficult when you have decentralization. So through decentralized replicas of a data set, you're able to secure that data set more effectively than you would a centralized server. And the issue that um, organizations are having to come to terms with is that centralized systems are subject to a single point of failure. And blockchains by nature are decentralized and therefore have a greater um, uh, opportunity for security and integrity of that data than a centralized system. So that's really the benefit of a blockchain in the DLT context is security uh, and radical transparency. Interesting. And, and are these companies like IBM, are they like doubling down and like spending more money on these uh, initiatives as well now? And Well, IBM as a vendor is providing um, the toolkit for mm. organizations like a Nestle to have certified um, fruit purees or... Um, and then Hillary, really interesting. I mean, you know, in our previous conversation, I was telling you about Data and how it's just like this ginormous company. What, what, what are they? Are you, I mean, are you, you probably aren't even allowed to share, but just curious, like companies like that, what are they What are they exploring on the blockchain? Like, what are they? I, I know TCS recently did announce publicly that they are building or looking to build applications for, for banks to offer Bitcoin exchange facilities. So, so I get that one that I think that's super clever and, and probably uh, appropriately timed, but curious, uh, any, any other things that you are able to maybe share like shipping? Well, like, is a great I one? can say Sunny is that they're doing everything under the sun because um, mm. uh, Tata was our presenting partner at our conference um, blockchain revolution global. And they had 10 different sessions of different blockchain projects um, that they're working on. And it touches every single industry. It was really quite fascinating. They were present in, in all of our industry verticals. We had discussions in supply chain, in financial services, in healthcare, in, you know, as a major technology provider, they're there to provide um, the solution regardless of the industry. So the scope is, um, is really quite vast. And uh, we know that they're doing some, um, you know, amazing work. In, in different industries. So it's it's not what, but um, you know, how many, it's really quite uh, fascinating. And same thing with IBM from healthcare to uh, shipping to customs and borders to, you know, pharmaceuticals. Uh, hey, Hillary, maybe it might make sense also to kind of just define, I guess, what the goal of the organization is, right? We kind of just dove in, like assuming that obviously I, I know a lot about what you guys do, but but do you mind maybe sharing a little bit about, you know, kind of like what was the goal? What, what did Don set out to do? And then over the last few years, what have you guys kind of been up to um, yeah, on sure. that front? Mm -hmm. So the BRI was established to investigate through um, research um, how blockchain was transforming different industry verticals and providing a um, decision useful reports and projects and deliverables that would allow our member companies to create their blockchain strategies, to better understand blockchain technology, uh, to help prepare pilots and budgets and uh, make decisions, uh, to help prepare their organizations from a team building perspective, maybe they needed to hire some technologists. Maybe they need to think about the fact that their legal team might have to know a thing or two about um, digital assets. Um, so we are we exist to help governments and organizations uh, inform strategy, informing digital strategy and providing. And I think Oh, sorry, continue. I don't want to interrupt no, that. No, not at sorry. all. Um, being a resource so that these organizations don't have to go it alone. We host uh, roundtables to help um, further investigative work. Um, we provide 
deep insights on um, the experiences of other organizations so that they can learn and make decisions accordingly. Cool, cool. And hey, by the way, was it the World Economic Forum? It was some like like major international organization. I remember when I was in Don's office last, he had shared some reports. Is that is that accurate? Did you yeah, guys do I some mean, work with them? Yes. Like, that's pretty, uh, that's major, pretty out yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Don, um, in June of 2017, um, Don and Alex wrote a report for the World Economic Forum called um, a multi, it was a call for a multi-stakeholder approach to blockchain governance. And this was a call for collaboration at um, the application level, um, the industry and ecosystem level, and um, you know, government and, and higher levels. So different levels of collaboration where um, decisions could be made around uh, technology that, in, that were considerate of, of different interests and as a way of getting a win-win, as a way of getting, you know, the different parties involved in, um, in the tools of, of tomorrow. And as we see that it's, it's difficult to govern um, these projects. I mean, Bitcoin is, is you know, self-governing and improvement, pro uh, improvement proposals you know, there's a way that, that Bitcoin goes about its um, improvements and, and changes, same with Ethereum. But, you know, the, the call was really through the Economic Forum to come together and, um, and understand uh, these technologies. So that was an early project. It wasn't specific to the BRI, but it was published at the time that BRI was operational. And I have to say, Sunny, that since we have produced these insights on some of the complexities and challenges of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, whether it's regulation or implementation. Um, we have created other uh, business units. Um, for example, we've created a program through INSEAD and Coursera, um, a course on blockchain uh, for the enterprise and a second course on blockchain and financial services. So individuals can take the course, they can get a certification, they can become um, uh, more valuable within their organizations, improve their professional understandings of the, the technology and how it could be used in, um, in the context of, of their professional lives. And I think the other value that we create for entities is we don't only explore how blockchain impacts given industries, we take a look at how it affects the individual functions within a firm. So we have a series of research dedicated to blockchain and management um, from the CFO right through the C-suite into roles like the this chief strategy officer or the project management office, um, blockchain and the CFO. So whether you're chief financial officer of a, of a bank or whether the, you're the CFO of um, a consumer packaged goods company, Blockchain's coming for you. You need to have an understanding of cryptocurrencies. You need to have an understanding of, of this foundational technology because you're the one who's probably going to be approving budgets. You're going to be making big decisions that impact your company. So it was a call to get individuals up to speed. Same thing with human resources. Why is this technology significant for hiring? Well, it comes down to issues of credentials and reducing fraud in the hiring process, reducing fraud through a validation and verification process, not unlike the way coins are, um, uh, blocks of transactions are validated on Bitcoin or other platforms, but having a network of validators that validate a, a credential or a certification. So yes, this is true. And um, it takes my university degree, I can put whatever I want on LinkedIn, it could be a bag of lies. But if there are five validators from, uh, you know, different uh, parts of, you know, a, an education system, whether it's a fellow student of mine, um, my professor, uh, the university registrar, and so on and so forth, all validating that yes, indeed, this certificate is authentic, then you have trust, then you have lower costs, then you've got reduced fraud. So the HR function, marketing, um, there's, there's just so much that's going to take place that will impact marketing spends and the way that organizations engage with 
their customers that's going to leverage blockchain te technology. We're seeing it with browsers. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen more engagement between brands and consumers, but it's coming. And it's very disintermediating. So, you know, the, the BRI serves to educate. Um, we serve as, a, as an ecosystem for collaboration, for problem solving. Um, we have a book publishing business that's taken our research and, and, you know, made it more accessible along certain subject lines. So we've got a book called Supply Chain Revolution that's available on Amazon. Financial Services Revolution, also available on Amazon. We give those books away to our members as, um, as a value point to say, here's your collection of some of the best supply chain research uh, specific to blockchain. Let us know what you think. Cool. <clears throat> well, that's exciting. Um, okay, so let's, I mean, was there anything else you wanted to share on, uh, on blockchain? Um, yeah, or I mean, just, I guess, like the organization or anything on Don's point? Should we move on to the kind of the last point here? Go for the last point. I think I think of uh... so so yeah. So as I was mentioning earlier, so the the next question is around like you know what is there one I don't know maybe belief that you hold or truth that you hold that most others in Bitcoin um, let's say would disagree with you on. Let's say Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think on Bitcoin, um, <clears throat> I would get a lot of flack for saying that. Um, Bitcoin um, purists or um, hardcore Bitcoiners might, uh, maximalists, thank you. <laughs> My husband just said in the next room, he knows I was talking Bitcoin maximalists, thank you, um, are fooling themselves into thinking that mass adoption is around the corner. Um, having worked in this space for nearly four years and been involved in this space for over five, um, I think we're speaking to each other and being that bridge to the outside world, I know how difficult it is to um, have Bitcoin and blockchain conversations with uh, people from traditional industries. Um, the uh, Coindesk journalist, uh, I think her name's pronounced Lee, QN or Lei Quen. I don't, I don't know how to say her name, but anyway, she tweeted last week and I just want to get it right. That she said, dear anyone um, who thinks mass adoption is around the corner, try to pitch anything related to Bitcoin to non-crypto companies and you'll get humbled really quickly. Um, and it's not a popular opinion, but mm -hmm. I do think it's valid. And um, I think there's a degree of doubling down and retooling and marketing and positioning that the Bitcoin ecosystem needs to pursue for, for that mass adoption to take hold. Um, and I know at the BRI, we face enormous challenges, even getting organizations to describe their work with blockchains, with private blockchains and distributed ledger technology, there is still a lot of baggage associated with this technology. There is not a lot of trust out there. Um, I also think it's naive uh, for people to think that Bitcoin will be a payment, uh, a, unit, a unit of exchange and make payments because I think it's too inflationary a currency, which is ironic because I know with a fixed supply, it's not typically regarded as inflationary. Um, it's exactly the opposite. Inflation is by nature of the protocol uh, controlled and programmed up to 21 million Bitcoin, but it's price inflation that makes it unsuitable for um, a currency. Currencies need to have uh, stability in price. And that's what makes Bitcoin a better store of value and um, a unit of digital gold. The fact that it can be used as a medium of exchange is a bonus. And it makes that unit, it makes that um, um, uh, storage of value um, possible in the first place because you can always spend it if you need to, but it's not very efficient to spend it. Nobody wants to be the guy who spent two pizzas on, on or two Bitcoins on pizza or whatever it was. Because if you do believe that the Bitcoin will increase in value because of its fixed supply, then you'd want to hold on to it. Mm 
Mm. It's naturally a, very suitable as a, as a as an asset. Um, so I, I think it's a myth that it's going to make for a great payment mechanism. Cool. Okay. Or Have you seen Lightning? Uh, what do you think about that? About what? Sorry, I missed that about one. About Bitcoin as an effective payment mechanism. What do you no, say I think people? I agree with you that I am more intrigued by the fact that Bitcoin has gone up nine or 10 million percent in the time I've heard about it than I am about, you know, I mean, I think the fact that I can send it to anyone for a few bucks or whatever it is, or a few cents or if more than that is, is almost irrelevant because the fact that I'm able to store my hard work and my savings and my energy into something that goes up in value like humans have never seen before i i love that i love that and so that that that's my favorite part and yeah i think that i think i do think the payment side um i agree with you that it's not it's not like i'm not trying to buy coffee with it that's not my main concern i do i do worry more about like is it decentralized does it have all that kind of in place but i do i do think that things like lightning um are are you know a potential solution to to the coffee and the remittance uh, application you know at, in india for example in unocoin we see tens of thousands of people using it for remittance as, as a way of yeah. you know, they just get the bitcoin they sell it we help them by having an auto sell button auto sell you know public key but or public you know address for bitcoin that where we just as soon as they, so even if they're asleep in the middle of the night we just sell the Bitcoin, give them the rupees in their bank account so that they don't need to be exposed to price, you know, the price volatility, like you said, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So, so yes, I agree with you, but guess what? There's companies like ours that, that take care of that. Right. And yeah, so, yeah, and I think that remittance application is the most powerful and, and it was one of the, the um, use cases that I cited in my very first article when I wrote about blockchain being a powerful technology for women mm -hmm. specifically because of the, the, the remittances that are, um, I don't know if you have data on, on who sends remittances, but a lot of women send uh, remittances <clears throat> back home to their, um, their native lands. And have you ever heard of a guy named Muhammad Yunus? No. Okay. Okay. He started the idea of uh, microfinancing. Is it called microfinancing okay, or it's yeah. called the... Uh, it's like, it's like this notion that like you give someone a hundred dollars, they go and build a business, make them self-sustainable. And then they give you yeah. back your hundred dollars. Like he's a Nobel later. winner. Yeah. Yeah. Microfinance is an incredibly um, profitable business. Mm -hmm. It works mm -hmm. really, really well. It works very, very well because it's empowering. Um, and generally those small payments, uh, are not uh, um, they're not misused. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I was gonna say like the, the idea behind a social business is is such that there is no profit, right? They 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 they, they give it all back, and and it's not philanthropic either. It's it, I find it such a such an interesting idea. I've actually met Muhammad Yunus. I've read all his books as well. Oh, wow. it's, like, it's a fascinating concept. I've always wondered. I even asked him about. You know, he doesn't have the most positive feelings about Bitcoin when I met him, but uh, but 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 I do think maybe blockchain and th some things we're talking about, like you know, whether it be like this programmability using like Solidity on Ethereum or RSK or whatever, I think you could build micro microfinancing capabilities on top of something like Bitcoin and, you know, mm -hmm. but, but the reason I brought him up, the reason I brought him up, the reason I brought him up is because his, um, I don't know if you know this, but like, he, number one, he's got like a 99.9% .9 like, like whoever he like loans money to that he gets it back. Yeah. Um, and the reason is, is because he only gives women loans yeah. <laughs> i yeah. thought it was the funniest thing in the world but i can kind of see his point because i used to be a financial advisor back in like my previous lifetime like a long time ago and i had sat down with hundreds of families and the one thing i noticed i'm probably gonna get in trouble for saying this but the one thing i noticed is that in house and this is just a overall observation so nobody you know like uh kill me here but uh, one thing i noticed is that and it was like stark but like in households where the man um managed kind of the finances versus when the women did there was a very big difference and and oftentimes um uh you know, and, and Muhammad Yunus has kind of mentioned this too, is, is that whenever men have extra money, they tend to just blow it or spend it mm -hmm. on, you know, themselves. Uh, whereas, you know, usually most women 
tend to spend it on their family and save it and put it away. And, and so, you know, I know in our household, I, we have a similar type of arrangement. I try and, you know, make sure my wife has most of the controls. I, I literally relinquish control in some ways, like on purpose, just because I don't know, I don't, I don't trust myself. Well, my husband, so whenever he comes in, I want to buy more crypto. I tell him to go lie down. Like <laughs> we're good. We got, we're, we are good, you know, and, yeah we're at highs right now and it, it's true we are i think women by nature are, are less um or are more risk averse mm -hmm. and um yeah that the i i share your experience honey in financial management and seeing um that women are very effective in managing uh, household finance mm -hmm. i also see that when money goes out the door then love goes out the window and, yeah, I can see that, that happening. It, you know, it's the, it's the root of conflict, right? Mm, if we have mm -hmm. financial strain, it's the root of um, a lot of mental health problems are related mm. to financial loss and uh, poor financial management. Mm -hmm. Family breakdown. Family breakdown happens when uh, there are money struggles and when there are money disputes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the reasons why I originally wanted to go into financial services was mm. to have really good plans when you have really great transparent financial plans um keeps people together keeps families together keeps the peace yeah so people, people don't need to what is talk it talk about money oh my god i totally agree right if people don't plan to fail they just fit the yeah. plan yes yes exactly that's, that's it that's it oh yeah. my god i had all these one-liners down as a from my own brokerage but but you know i i hey okay so uh i thought that was pretty good oh yeah in in terms of the contrarian question anything you want to share outside of our let's say even bitcoin blockchain bubble like just globally speaking do you share any maybe like beliefs or thoughts that you that you know that you think that you believe to be true the most but most others are like Nah, no, never. No, no. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. I don't have any wild and crazy predictions. I do. I did want to say, though, that I think everybody should um, own some Bitcoin as a means to onboard themselves to um, crypto assets and blockchain technology in general. Cool. Um, like, I think hands on learning is absolutely critical and i'm dismayed at this idea that the us could come down hard on on individual wallets mm. because i first it was at the blockchain training conference when i downloaded um mycelium and andreas antonopoulos gave me two bucks worth of bitcoin and gave it to anybody who wanted to see how bitcoin transactions worked and i still have that transaction in a segregated wallet and i look at it today and it's just an incredibly powerful um, tool and reminder of what um, what the ledger can do, how that moment in time is forever recorded, that transaction, the block, um, the transparency, the change in value, it mm -hmm. just provided such an, it was an incredibly important learning experience. And so what I encourage people to do as a matter of course, whenever I, I give a talk, and I give a lot of one-on-ones to help kind of break down some of the jargon because I found learning about this space was like very difficult. Um, and I'm not, I'm, I, I'm humble um, to the point of like, there's so much I still don't know. I do my best and um, I just try to break it down to help other people, to help onboard other people, but I'm continually learning. I tell people in their learning journeys to buy some Bitcoin and even if they don't want to keep it, send it to a charity. Mm -hmm. And that action of value exchange using your mobile phone is very powerful. And uh, if you don't, if the light doesn't go on by that simple transaction, then it's on them. But yeah, when that yeah. happened to me, the light bulb went on and it, it, it changed things like forever. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that, that, that comes as, up as like a common theme too, for a lot of people that I interview is like, that moment where you have your first transaction so anyone who's listening to this you know if, you, if you're just like reading and listening to youtube videos and stuff like you gotta try it you gotta like get even like a tiny 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 bit like you gotta just 
you got to try it. And then, and then it's like, um, yeah. Um, Hey, before I let you go though, there's one thing I want to talk to you about. So um, a couple of years ago in the kind of the thick of all of the regulatory uncertainty in India, if you will, um, you know, I'm, I'm in Toronto. So I was, I was invited actually by, by Don to speak at his event. Um, and it was a interesting experience because Don told me in advance, he said, Sonny, I'm going to put you on, on stage with some people who are, you know, really important, like regulatory wise. And he said, I don't want you to hold back your punches. I want you to, I want you to say it as it is. I want you to express how you feel. And I mean, that in itself, I was just like, Don's the man, like Don, to, for him to say that, like, come to my conference, speak your mind. I'm going to put you on a stage on a panel with all these really important people. So I was just like, okay, so that's super cool. Um, and you know, that back then it was like a dark time. Like I said, it was a really tough time. So I took him up on his offer. I spoke on stage. There was like, I don't want to name the companies, but there were some really, really big, impressive companies. And there was a lady there from uh, the OECD. And, uh, and she at the, so when I went on stage and I said how obviously I wasn't happy as an entrepreneur in terms of what happened with the RBI in India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and a long time later, like a year later or something after having met her and being on stage with her, she invited me to speak at the OECD, like what the heck, right? And the OECD, for those who don't know, I've been speaking about it in my different interviews, but they're like, I mean, do, do you know what, like, do you know how to like define them? I mean, I, Organization I can... for Economic Cooperation and Development. They are awesome. But and it must you... have been Caroline. Uh, well, um, yeah, that's exactly Caroline who Malcolm. Was. Yeah, yeah. And uh, no, they're, they're amazing. They get it. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so this is like the regulators of regulators. Like, what do you want to call them? I mean, like, if you had to explain it to my mom or something, like, like they're they're very important, right? Like, I, I, I. Okay, okay. So when I was working for Kraken last year, Jesse was kind enough to send me to go speak at this event because I had asked if I could because I felt like it was important and I wanted to see what was up <laughs> more than anything. And uh, it was in Paris, and it was a very, very interesting experience. Very, so I'm so I wanted to kind of publicly say thanks to Dawn, first of all, for and yourself for kind of making a lot of that happen. Um, and for Caroline for inviting me. And and I and, and it's out there on the internet on their website, I got to like kind of pull it out and make it more available. But but they have actually my my whatever I spoke with, uh, with Loretta and some others. And it was really it was really intense. Um, yeah, dude, I'd love to see that, Sunny. I'd love for you to share that session. With okay. Me. And, okay. Uh, I'm a I'll fan take, of I'll, Yeah, I got to work some magic because, like I said, it's like super buried on their website yeah. and it's like not really findable or searchable or whatever, but I know how to get it out. Sunny, you're an engineer and an innovator and there you go yeah yeah it's not hard yeah, yeah. we'll do, search the do. web you can so i'm gonna i'm gonna figure it out so i'll get it out i'll make it available um but the reason i brought it up is is, is for a larger more kind of relevant and current issue which is this like you which is what you're talking about which is this like regulation or maybe even like banning uh you know cryptocurrency exchanges from or not allowing them to send money to self-hosted wallets you talked about how the united states is rolling it out my understanding is, is that FATF um, is something that's, you know, it's pretty public and a lot of people, I mean, at least I am very aware of it, but there is this organization that's kind of connected to OECD and, and FATF and all that, but there's this something called a travel rule that's being applied as well, right? And this is essentially what the banks have to do in terms of adherence to, the, to their, you know, regulatory framework. But what it is in, in essence is, is that when, let's say, one exchange sends money to another, they would need to essentially, within that transaction, and disclose the information around who that is and, you know, that we've done KYC on them, et cetera, et cetera. And if it was like some self-hosted Trezor wallet or some whatever, then, you know, you don't have KYC done on that. Therefore, as an exchange, you wouldn't be able to send money there. So uh, where am I getting at? What are your thoughts? So I have, a, I have a lot of question marks around. So I, again, I looked on Wikipedia. I went to the event. Um, I read that this was an organization that was created post-World War II uh, it, to rebuild, I guess, parts of Europe and, and Germany and whatnot. And so who are these regulators of regulators, <laughs> the elected officials? And how are they able to tell you and I whether or not we get to, you know, send money to your mycelium wallet? Wow, what a long question. I'm well, gonna... <laughs> I'm going to give you, no, it's very related. And it, this 
having worked for a Swiss bank, we were subject to a lot of scrutiny for historical reasons for Swiss banks being um, accused and having participated in the confiscation of the assets of Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust. Their, their assets were transferred to Swiss banks and held in vaults and those assets were repatriated over the decades by um, you know, a massive uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration with uh, authorities and advocates who were saying that these funds were stolen, they need to be repatriated. In many cases, you know, the families were, uh, there was nobody alive to receive them. And Swiss banking secrecy has come under global scrutiny because of um, the idea that uh, laundered funds were, you know, held up in Swiss banks, that the proceeds of terrorism were in Swiss banks, and that, um, you know, it was not very good for the branding. And, you know, international money transfers were a regulated thing. And the idea was that war is bad and terrorism is bad and that malicious actors are, are bad and money is the way that they um, are enabled. And so if we control the flow of funds, we can make the world a more peaceful place. So it was those principles that were established uh, um, at Bretton Woods after the Second World War. Um, so if you have a coordinated system, you can you can reduce, um, you know, financing for malicious actors. Um, even after 9/11, so in 2001, when the towers went down in New York, um, the alarm bells went off about how funds were raised by terrorist organizations internationally. And the US government took a very hard line on banking um, and making sure that KYC and due diligence had been done by financial institutions in the United States, but not just there in Canada as well. And so UBS in Canada was subject to um, the fallout of, of ramped up KYC. And the idea was that if you don't do your KYC, we're going to kick you out of the States. You will not operate your business here, period, end of story. So get your act together and comply with legislation because they did not have a sense of humor about um, terrorist finance or other uh, uh, or money laundering. Like tax collection is a big deal and terrorist financing is a big deal. So the regulators take these kinds of activities um, very, very seriously because terrorism finances weapons and weapons kill people. That's the political context for um, financial regulation. And um, we needed to increase our due diligence. This is part of the reason why I left UBS at the time. We had accounts from Latin America. And in Latin America, as you would know, I did a lot of traveling in Colombia. I lived in Argentina for several months. and the threat of, of kidnapping is real and families who earn a legitimate business, who run a factory, who own land, who run a business are subject to kidnapping, particularly in the 80s and 90s in Colombia when FARC was um, at peak operations. But even after that, same thing in Argentina, it was a cottage industry. And for very legitimate reasons, families would move their money offshore and they needed privacy and they needed security um, to protect their businesses and their families. Families that I visited in Colombia had two Toyota Camrys that were both white and their license plates were one digit apart. That was to stay below the radar of potential kidnappers. No one could know that their family had money because they were so terrified of being kidnapped and murdered. So a lot of Latin Americans had funds in Canada. They liked Canada as a, as a destination to, to park their money. And after the 9-11 crackdown by the US authorities on the financial services institutions that operated in North America, we were required to get our house in order and to have passport copies of every beneficial owner. Uh, we couldn't have numbered accounts and have anonymous accounts. We needed to know who we were dealing with so that we could say with certainty that our clients were not financing um, trade and illegal weapons, that they weren't financing terrorism and they weren't evading their taxes. 
and every transaction that takes place gets reported to the government. That is the power system within which we work. That is the system. It's a, it is a, you know, a collaborative uh, undertaking between banks and, and governments. That there's a natural incentive there for governments to work with banks and for banks to work with governments. But, you know, like you said, Hillary, there is all, always a need for, I, I agree, bad guys use, um, you know, these these types of accounts for bad, nefarious purposes. But like you said, also good guys do too, whether it's that family sure. in Colombia hiding from the Forex or whatever. So in that vein, uh, you know, Bitcoin now is not a country. Um, it's open source code that is malleable and can be made more private or less private. And there are other crypto assets like Monero and Zcash that are far more private. Um, so a bastion of freedom and privacy is being created, whether we like it or not. And I just worry that some short-sightedness on the regulator's behalf will create this like massive divide between, let's say, you know, a dark pool of Bitcoin and like the white KYC pool. Maybe that is eventually Bitcoin's future. Hopefully not. Um, sure. I mean, you and I know there's bad money everywhere, regardless of whether it's in cash or it's in a Swiss bank account or a U.S. bank account or it's in Bitcoin. But mm -hmm. there will all, the world will always have bad actors. But the majority of crime takes place with cash, et cetera, et cetera. Um, have a look at President Obama's speech at South by Southwest. Swiss bank in your pocket? Uh, Is that the, was that the one you made that comment? Yeah. Like Bitcoin's a Swiss bank in your pocket? Uh, no, that's not the comment. I'm Different one. That's the one I remember. Probably. No, so he's, <laughs> he's talking about keys. And he's mm. talking about keys. I think it's 2015. And you and I both know that onboarding to this space and terminology, private key, public key, um, asymmetric cryptography and all the lingo that goes with understanding how these systems work is, you know, take some, take some um, onboarding and take some study. And when he was at South by Southwest, it was expected that Hillary Clinton would win the election. And it was as if he was laying the groundwork for saying, look, the government has a fundamental need um, for being able to control uh, revenues. And it sounded as though his talk of keys was indicative of the fact that, that forced confiscation of, of private keys could be a very real play. Um, and I think Preston Byrne has spoken about this to say, you know, not my keys, not my crypto, sure. But when the authorities are at the door and they're gonna take you off to prison, they're gonna say either hand your keys or you're, you're you know, um, you're going to have a, a long, cold interview in a in an unfurnished environment. Right, but you know, you know, you know, you know. Uh, do you know what brain wallets are? No, tell me. It's like what you just memorized ten or fifteen or twenty five words, and you that's it. That is your. Oh key. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, it does come down to a freedom of speech issue, I think, as well. And and I don't think people are can be coerced into anyway so, so i think that that'd be, that'd, be, that'd be interesting we'll see what happens right because i mean yeah, we'll see this is why happens. i love bitcoin right because it's like, it it's like yeah because I, I think what you're saying you're, you're i mean that happened during the gold era and we talked about Bretton woods a bit by the way we should probably do like a follow-up if you're down we could we could probably uh go down some pretty Kill some more time interesting <laughs> uh interesting uh yeah conversations here and by the way you know Bretton woods is being revisited my my, yeah. my one of our investors and friend is simon simon uh from Bank to the Future, he he does a lot of YouTube videos on kind of what that means and what could potentially happen and how to prepare for it. Um, but uh, anyways, Hillary, this has been fantastic. Time kind of just flew by. It's been an hour yeah, and a half. Funny. I want to be mindful of your calendar. Um, but uh, any any parting words where people can maybe uh, follow you, learn more about you, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, I don't know, website. Sure. Um Hillary with one L, uh, Hillary Carter MSC on LinkedIn. Um, look me up at the blockchain research institute.org. I'm tweet from Hillary on Twitter. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm totally, I'm going to live by uh, Dawn's principles of, you know, digital connectivity. If you reach out, um, you'll, you'll, I'll be good for a response. Wonderful. Well, I like that. Awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, for this opportunity, this chat, and I'd love to have a follow-up call sometime. And and um, I'm really hoping that that the U.S. 
gives um, some very careful consideration before sweeping into a decision about a wallet. I hope so too. Uh, I hope so too. Yeah, because you... technology flourish. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I'm all. I mean, I'm, I shouldn't say I'm all for regulation, but I'm I'm for thoughtful regulation. Obviously, if it's going to prevent you know little children from being uh, exploited and whatever, whatever. I mean, like yeah, there are certain things that I can definitely rally around. Um, okay, cool. So with that, Hillary, I think we'll bring this one to a close. You know, I I think yeah. Hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we get a lot of eyeballs on this and get people watching this and people edit away, out to you. funny edit oh i don't do actually a lot of editing to be honest i kind of just load it as is but um but peter todd's interview from two days ago got like 200 views on the first day which was sounds small i don't know people were like that's it 200 views but uh but hey (laughs) hey, my my point is it's more than just my mom watching now but mom i love you if you're out there okay we'll we'll, 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 (laughs) we'll end this one here thank you